Hello, my name is Derek Etriad and I'm with Creative Technology. We are here at our XR stage at uh, Occidental Studios here in Hollywood, California to talk about virtual production and some of the recent developments in XR Studio. So we're gonna kick it off and start with Michael. Uh, over the course of the past few years, you've transitioned from filming on traditional sets to more virtual production, especially XR. How does your business foster the development of new ideas? With Final Pixel, our vision is all about removing the limits to creativity. Uh, and as such, we're always looking for the, the next big idea, the next kind of crazy idea that our clients have. It's basically in our DNA with what we do. So for us, there's kind of three key areas. Um, those areas are uh, with our clients. So we work really closely with agencies, production companies, uh, producers, commissioners alike on the development of ideas and how you can use virtual production to really put those ideas into practice. And that approach has led us to continually push boundaries, try new things. And that's why we're here today doing this technical test. For our um, the second areas with our crew, you know, and in particular the art department and the virtual art department, you know, we try and create a space where everyone has a chance to experiment and try new things. Um, we're, we're not afraid of making you know wrong choices here and there. Uh, it's good to learn from your mistakes, and I think that we really try and push things in that area. I think on the, on the third area is then around how we um, how we share what we do. So, you know, it's really part of our kind of core values to continually learn and then continually spread that learning out into the industry and amongst our partners and people that we work with. And I think that's really helped ignite, you know, more and more ideas and creativity across the piece with virtual production. Awesome. Thank you. Chris or Monica, anything to add to that? Um, I think we're going to see filmmaking and television production change irrevocably. It, it's, it's incredible what's going to happen in the next few years. And it feels very exciting to be here at the beginning of it. And it is clear to us that this is how the vast majority of film and television is going to be made in a few years time. And so we have to be open to new ideas. We're, and, and we're basically trying to be a company that is only about new ideas. Uh, every shoot that we do, um, something goes wrong. Bing. <laughs> we lose a key light. Uh, every shoot we do, there's some impossible challenge that, that, that we have to surmount. And honestly, we, we couldn't make our clients happy without all the support that we, we get from you guys uh, all the way along the chain. Awesome. Thank you. I was going to say, from, from my point of view as the producer and somewhat of a realist, I get very excited about this idea of, create. you know, this opens up creativity with no limits, but I know a lot of my clients have very specific limits and very specific needs. And I love that, yes, we can create any environment that exists in anywhere or not, but we also can create environments that they necessarily can't get to or logistically are impossible for them budget-wise and that I can solve their problems that are, are relatively no, like standard usual problems and we can solve them with this technology um, and and help them achieve their dreams, even if their dreams are just to come in on budget and produce the creative that they want. I love that. In addition to, let's go to the moon. That too is fantastic. <laughs> Next question is for Steven from Creative Technology. Creative Technology does a lot of corporate work. How does Creative Technology adopt a virtual production workflow and how are you seeing XR technology being used on the corporate environment, especially during and into a post COVID world? We looked at opportunities in 2021 to replace large scale in-person physical events in a virtual production realm. And for one of a, the big retail clients we work, work for, we replicated what they did across a 200,000 square foot convention center into 200 XR shoots over the space of 10 weeks. And they were able to deliver their message without leaving a particular warehouse in Atlanta. So <clears throat> there's definitely a place for this virtual production workflow in the corporate market. I do think as we come out of this back into some level of normality, it will start to fall off on the corporate side of things where we may see the, the virtual hybrid side of the event needing some of the AR, potentially XR components. Um, but as the guy said earlier, it is in film and television and commercial where this is going to change the landscape. 
One big area I think is going to dominate is indie films. Those five to $15 million budgets. Mm -hmm. This is going to become the dominant player within the next 24 months. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, some of the more, more technical stuff. Uh, Josh, in this virtual production workflow, what are some things that you need to take into preparation for a different type of shoot? Uh, so we're, we are working as hard as we can to make it as seamless of an integration for anybody trained in a traditional film workflow or traditional corporate workflow to show up on set, not have to learn too much of the new bits in order to just jump right in, do their job and fulfill their scope within this world. There are of course a lot of technical challenges that we run into every day. All this stuff is still pretty new. We're still figuring out new ways to do things every time we do a shoot, trying to make it prettier, better, trying to get as much realism as we can on camera we do always have a couple little things that need to, that sometimes are a bit of hiccups. We need to allot for a little bit of time of testing on site. Lens changes aren't really as simple as they were when it's a real set anymore. Now we always have to take into account the, all our 3D tracking, our mapping data, making sure everything in the virtual world aligns with any time we're changing anything out. Uh, I'd say one of our biggest hindrances at this point is when we're doing smaller camera setups, steady cams, handhelds and shoulder mounts, it's, we're working on ways to make it wireless, but we're not fully at a reliable wireless way yet. But some of the things that we rely on means there's a hod of cable following around the camera op now. And it's working with our teams ahead of time. It's working with our camera ops, our DPs and cinematographers ahead of time to make sure that we account for all of their needs into our production workflows. Also the amount of gear on site, we need to now allocate an area of our set just for all of the servers and all the technical bits that run these worlds. Uh, I'm sure it's comparable to what used to be needed for art and decor storage before. We, you know, we no longer have to build these massive sets. We just have to put smaller sets in front of them. But we still need to allot space on site and planning for our site layout to have those things. Plus all the noise that's generated from. Like right now we're sitting next to a bank of servers and I hear fans running nonstop for the past week. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. It takes a lot of computer processing power to make this stuff happen, but we need to work with our producers, work with our audio department ahead of time to make sure that we have gear to baffle those sounds or put them somewhere where they're well out of earshot, but we still have control positions. Yeah. It's almost like you have to be a trained IT technician mm -hmm. to get these systems up and running now. Uh, I'm sure all of us have learned way more than we ever initially anticipated when we were younger about technical network management. And we've all nerded out way beyond <laughs> what we ever first saw ourselves doing. Uh, but it's an interesting workflow. I'd say for anybody who wants to get into this, it'd be an interesting place for someone to focus on learning and developing their skills going into this workflow. So if you want to shoot a bunch of cinema stuff, but you're a true computer nerd, now there may be more of a hope for you than there once was. Um, how are you seeing these virtual productions um, and this technology being deployed in other industries, maybe outside of the film and television? Um, yeah, I can um, talk about that a little bit. I think. Uh, coming from the disguise perspective, obviously, uh, as, as Stephen pointed out earlier, we've all been part of the live events production world for many, many, many years. And, and, and for us as a company to, I hate to use the word pivot, but it, it's what we did uh, in, into word. film and TV production. <laughs> I think what will be very interesting to see in the months or years to come is how can the technologies that we've so rapidly developed in the past 12, 18 months be utilized in creating in-person experiences mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and I think uh, there's been so much technology uh, developed in the past 12 months in terms of real-time rendering, camera tracking, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that will be utilized on live events to kind of create these hybrid experiences, um, which I think will be very, very interesting to see. You know, right now, everyone, uh, when they're thinking about virtual production, a lot of times they're thinking about these massive, gigantic volumes for for large, you know, major motion pictures, but I think there will certainly be a market for, for things like like just smaller things like insert stages and and things like that and, and television that people aren't thinking of that are that are just on a much smaller level. But uh, the technology certainly will be utilized more and more, and that's where you know the game will be changed, you know, considerably. Um, I think that uh, it's cool that we've seen all this technology proven at a large scale now. And what I'm looking forward to seeing is uh, all the creative, smart people taking this and figuring out the new ways that we can't even foresee right now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly what it's going to be. Yeah. But now that it exists, I'm sure we're going to see some really interesting things uh, using this technology. Yeah. And it's, it still feels like to a certain extent, like 
obviously the, the types of production that have been done utilizing this technology, like they're absolutely amazing, but we're still just, I think, scratching the surface of, of what is possible, uh, both on the creative side and the technical side. Uh, and I think that's something that we'll just learn more and more about and explore these technologies and the, the creative applications of these technologies in, in, um, in the time to come. Uh, I don't think that we've seen uh, anything yet uh, of, of what can actually be done with this. So Sean and Daniel, part of the reason we're all here today is because we're testing out in Demarine a new technology Brompton has just released called frame remapping. Do you guys want to go into a little bit about what frame remapping is? Can you take that? Yeah, go ahead. So frame remapping evolved from frame rate multiplication, which was created for, um, for example, shooting at high frame rates for slow motion, inserting color or tracking information into what you're doing. Um, and the idea came out of um, if you have multiple frustums, what if they overlap? You could actually have them both on the wall at the same time. So that breaks down yet another barrier and opens up uh, more, more options where we're meeting the filmmakers where they are to allow them to do what they want to instead of being a barrier or, or a workaround. Yes. So just a question on that though, from the DP and the content and filmmaker side of things, what do you see that that technology is gonna open up for you guys moving forward? Oh, oh my God. We have, we've done multiple two camera shoots this year. And for us, time is money. Um, when you're doing a commercial and your, your money clock is, is just like spinning, and to be able to shoot with two cameras, uh, you get double the coverage, you get the job done and you make your day. Now, what we find so far is we kind of get our knickers in a twist with the two firstums kind of overlapping and it wrecks the shot. And uh, you know, it wrecks, it wrecks both shots often. And, and we've had to kind of go back and try and plan again. It also means that uh, in directing, you have to be really careful and planning your shots so the two first ones don't overlap. And so having the ability for the, these two first ones to overlap allows us to get the double coverage and, and get through our day a lot quicker. It's just a massive productivity boost. It's huge for us, it's huge. And so it's, that's why we are here and so keen to, to see this test. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Jim, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, Josh set it up. Uh, <laughs> there's still some, in my opinion, shakedown to it as far as with both cameras at traditional 180 degrees, the screen flickering is is pretty pretty noticeable. Not to the two taking cameras, just to the environment here. None of the light pollution hits the actors because we're sharing frames. But what Josh came up with was sharing frames, but having one camera at a 45 degree shutter, less light, which means the shared screen can be dimmer. So the flickering is minimized. As someone standing on stage, especially if you're engulfed in a larger volume, I would say, if you have any of those frustums kind of on the side of your eye line, as we get more and more flicker, you actually, it, it is disorienting. Yeah. And I would think, I, I am no trained actor, I'm sure they can handle it better than I can, <laughs> but I'm sure it would be very distracting to somebody who's trying to go through their lines, go through their blocking, actually get through a shoot to do something like that. So we've, tried, we've kind of found what we found, what we thought at this point is our best happy medium. I would call yeah. it. Uh, I'm sure there's more test development when you go further down the line to say, how far can we push this tech? Yeah. Like, what can we do? And then quick ways to go in and out of it, like we've all been discussing the past couple of days of now optimizing the workflows so that we're in, the town is in an uncomfortable environment only for the minimal amount of time possible. Yeah. Thank so you. just a question though, Sean and, and Marcus from the hardware side of things, where do you guys see this going over the next six months to you know, again, make the physical environment more natural feeling to actors and that standing in front of these volumes? Uh, I think there's two sides to it. I think uh, one very important aspect that we did discuss earlier is, is color pipelines. Uh, and I think that is, that is something that needs to be better understood and better uh, managed on set uh, in terms of achieving natural colors that not only do they appear natural to the camera, but they also appear pleasant and, and to, to the actors and, and all the, the, the crew on set. Uh, and then from a technical perspective, I think um, we're all we're still stuck using a lot of old infrastructure. 
um, when it comes to signal, signal distribution, like we're still using very much of HDMI and SDI and so on and so forth. Um, and I think especially when it comes to doing things like this, that is so critical when it comes to timing. Uh, I think moving over to a more IP-based infrastructure, SIMT2110, yeah. PTP sync and stuff like that, is definitely going to be critical in, in making this more usable and more, uh, uh, more achievable. And then uh, with uh, the row side of things, I mean, obviously you guys have taken <clears throat> the view and coming out with a very in-camera Pacific version of the Black Pearl. Mm -hmm. And how do you guys see that evolving, you know, in the coming 12 to 24 months? As demand is just going through the roof. Right, yeah. Um, I think what we're focusing on now is improving the hardware to allow it to run uh, at faster refresh rates. That's like a really big thing when it comes to the virtual production. Yeah. And uh, just getting things to run quicker so that uh, we can smooth out the flickering like what we're talking about be because you have to drive the tile at a higher frame rate than uh, what you typically do. Yeah. Um, and that's really one of the biggest things. Like we're always trying to uh, kind of get improved LEDs and make the resolution smaller or, or higher. But the LED drivers that we use, that's really the, the big improvement that we're going to be looking at to kind of uh, drive it faster, just like I said. And do you guys all see the desire to get to a fully native like HDR workflow mm -hmm. from you know, servers through processing to display so that the cameras are picking up you know, absolutely the best you know, thing that they can pick up to render? Not to go into sales pitch mode here, but uh, <laughs> in the latest latest version of our software, we have a full on ACES pipeline, so we can bring in uh, content from any source, convert it into a linear color space, do color grading and adjustments, and then output it into whatever the LED is is ex uh, expecting. And I think those kinds of uh, control pipelines, when it comes to color, is, is going to be absolutely critical. So you can use HDR. Uh, you don't really have to worry about grading your content. Uh, what if you're shooting plates, for example, uh, doing that in pre, you can just take it in, ingest it as it is, um, and do everything live. Yeah, and our processors are already supporting HDR yeah. using our Hydra calibration, unlocking the full potential of the panels. Um, we use PQ HDR and also uh, Color Spaces to Rec 2020. It's available now. And then on the LED side of things, uh, I mean, all that is great until you get it to display out of a panel that doesn't uh, yeah. support that color yeah. space. Absolutely. So yeah, uh, obviously we're looking at sourcing uh, batches of LEDs that can uh, support the full REC 2020 color space. It's a, a little bit difficult at the moment, but it's definitely something we're focused on. And then on the content side of things, obviously, you know, Unreal is, you are you live and die by that. And How much do you think that Unreal 5 is going to change what you guys can deliver creatively to your clients. Shall I, Michael, do you want to answer that? I think I saw Michael draw yeah. when he first saw it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is interesting though, um, with Unreal Engine 5, is it naturally comes with a whole new bank of tools and skills to learn. Um, and I think it just highlights the kind of continual evolving skills requirement that this industry comes with, that although you create new technology and there's, there's new innovation constantly out there, it's our role as producers and filmmakers and, and people that bring it all together to really make sure that there's the skills and the talent development out there to actually deliver on it. And with Unreal Engine 5, we need everyone now to learn how to use that. And it's only through that time and effort that we'll start to really see the results. Um, but I, I also think that the, the level of photorealism is what's going to be required by the more discerning of our clients. We, we already know um, that for most viewers at home, they can't tell the difference. But we have we have clients who walk on stage and they'll say, oh, I s resolution could be a bit higher. Mm -hmm. I, and for those people, um, Unreal Engine 5, I think, is, is they'll be converted. And that will be for, that's the cliff that I see, that, that where everything goes all in on virtual production when we start to see that people unable, unable to tell the difference between a real location um, and something constructed on Unreal, and I think that's going to come in, in two years' time. Right. Well, if we could probably sit here and talk all day, but we are on set, and I do need to get back to uh, making this happen for today. So thank you guys all for being here. This was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael, for joining us from London. Thank you, uh, Ro, Brompton, and Disguise for being here as well. It's great to just catch up with everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Derek.